Good evening. How you doing there? All right. <laughs> good, good. Every week, I did call Angel, but I didn't get no answer though. But she told me because she called me. I guess but after you had called, so she she missed your call. And she was gonna call you back. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah, she called because she told me she had missed your call. Okay. But she seemed to know she said she's doing better, but it took her for a loop and everything. She finished up her antibiotics today, she said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, all of that, you know, that flu and pneumonia and COVID and all of that stuff is just similar. I got to notice. I don't know. I guess I'm on the right one. <laughs> Now, the reason I asked, because uh, uh, it's, it's, I got to notice that Rita had joined, but I don't see her. <laughs> yeah, you, this is the right one, because I'm on this. I put in your yeah, code and everything. Yeah, greater spiritual. Okay, maybe she had joined another one or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess I mistyped something. <laughs> on Facebook. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, I don't even remember typing it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Maybe it was laying on the, on, the, on the keyboard or something. Oh, then she, I see a pop up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's the time has arrived that we're gonna get ready to get started. So it's good to see everyone uh, on Zoom and then see people that's connected via Facebook. So I get get in. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Come on in. Come on in. So let us open up. Oh, this must be Oscar type. Okay. Because <laughs> I, right. I know I'm not typing anything. <laughs> okay, because I forgot I'm on his on his phone. So he must be on his phone <laughs> typing. Because I'm like, I didn't type not a thing. He has a clear picture. You on, uh, you on Zoom on his phone? Uh, no, I'm actually, I'm on my on, on the uh, PC and everything. Oh, okay. But he, but I'll, see, I'll see my name. I'm looking at Facebook, like see <laughs> comments, and I'm not I'm not typing comments. So that must be also <laughs> typing comments. And so I, I'm on his on his phone. Okay, good evening. So let's go to the Lord in prayer so we can get started tonight. It's good to see everyone again. And so, Father God, we come saying good evening, Holy Spirit. Good evening, uh, Father God. Good evening, Jesus Christ. We want to just acknowledge the Trinity. Because we know, Lord God, that the Trinity is real. And so we just said thank you. And we just said good evening to everyone else. And we just welcome everyone to this Bible study session. We pray that everyone had a good day. And we just pray, Lord, right now that you just settle down our spirits, Lord God. Quiet every thought, Lord God, that may be racing through our heads, Lord God. We ask you, Lord God, center, center us right now on the study at hand, Lord God, that we can continue this study on how to study the Bible, Lord God. And we just thank you, Lord God, that we want to go deeper, deeper, deeper in our Bible study reading this year, Lord God, that we want to get more and more out of our Bible reading, Lord God, and our Bible study time, Lord God. We want to get onto the meat of your word, Lord God, and we want to rightly divide your word right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Have your way tonight. Have your way, have your way. We love you, we adore you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and amen, and amen. And so uh, this is, I think, the fifth time we've come together on studying God's word. I kicked off the uh, about inductive uh, Bible study, and last week I talked to you and said that it consists of three things, observation, interpretation, 
and uh, application. And so tonight we're going to start, we talked a little bit about those three areas, but tonight we're going to get into a little bit more depth of observation and then if the time permits, we'll get into interpretation and see what that means. And so uh, observation, let me call it back later on, a tax man. <laughs> text them before I started. Observation is defined as the act of the recognizing and noting a fact or occurrence. It means to be mentally aware of what one sees. Amen. So in the Bible, we, ha we have to you know we read it not only with our, you know, with our with our mind, but we read it with our eyes too and stuff. Be aware of what we're seeing in God's word. And so the purpose of observation is to saturate ourselves with the content of the passage of scripture to become as familiar as possible with all that the Bible writer is saying and implied. Again, we have to learn how to be mentally aware of what one sees and stuff, you know, and that's intentionally, intentionally seeing some things, you know, with our eyes and also with the spirit. And so accuracy is important in observation. You know, just like you're driving down the highway and stuff, you know, and you observing the traffic light. Accuracy is important. Now, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to make sure that you that if it's a red light, you're not seeing green and stuff, you know, and stuff, this stuff that you really see the right color of that traffic light. And so, accuracy is very important in observation. Not everything we read will be of equal value in attain, uh, ascertaining or de uh, determining the meaning of the passage. So we'll learn what to, uh, how to discern what is important and what is not. And that, even if it's not so important, it's still good to know those things and stuff. So sometimes, you no, know, it's good to, to bring out some of the, the things that we think is least important, just like I preached on Sunday about uh, 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 Thaddeus, you know, he was one of those disciples that you don't know him, him, him much about him, but that don't mean he was not important Amen. and everything. And then when you get into Old Testament, you got the minor prophets and you got the major prophets. But it doesn't mean that the minor prophets are, uh, is no more relevant than the major prophets and everything. So, so we need to discern sometimes what's the meaning of what's good and what's, uh, uh, I mean, what's, what's major and what's not so major. But again, everything is important now. Everything is important. So, so we need to pray Practice and we need to concentrate. And, uh, and there are two ingredients that we are helping to sharpen our expertise and, and they'll carry us a long way when we get into observation. And so also, again, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. And in every aspect of Bible study, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit because we know the Holy Spirit is our teacher, is our guide. You know, Jesus left the Holy Spirit here to bring things back to our remembrance and also to teach us out of his word and stuff. That's why it says not to lean to our own understanding. And so in observation, we begin to observe the text as a whole, as a whole, the text as a whole. And, th and that means it could be a portion of scripture. Or it could be an entire book. It could be an entire Bible, whatever. So we should study the Bible, you know, book by book, because each book of the Bible is a complete message in and of itself. Amen. And so again, well, uh, the only thing I, I will say about that too is stuff, you know, you know, read book by book. But one of the things when you like reading the gospels, sometimes, you know, it's good to read those gospels together, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially kind of read those together. But again, again, you can take it book by book, you know, go one book after another and everything. And so sometimes when you're doing uh, the, how to, how to read the Bible in a year, some of those, uh, 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 some of those uh, things that uh, pamphlets, whatever, you know, they have you skipping here, skipping in the old, yeah. skipping in the new, you know, read a little bit here, read a little bit there and all that and stuff. But to be really effective and stuff, we need to learn how to read the whole book in its entirety and everything and stuff. And again, in Bible study, and you might not get to the whole book. Well, I know you're not going to get to the whole book, <laughs> you know, in, in one sitting and everything. That's okay. The people, the, the, you know what they said, how do you eat an elephant? And, and one bite at a time. One bite at a time and stuff. And so when you're reading the book, uh, reading the Bible, you know, you read it sometimes one book at a time, or sometimes you read it one chapter at a time, sometimes one paragraph at a time and stuff, you know. And so uh, 
So we need sometimes you know, when I tell new converts, you know, I tell them what book to choose from when they start reading, you know, and stuff. And so and so and so we keep that principle for us and stuff by reading books of the Bible. You know, uh, Dr. Bobby and uh, Bishop Peace and Mother Georgia and uh, Minister Peggy. You know, they are reading through the Bible. They're going verse by verse by verse, book by book by book. They're not jumping around. They started at Genesis one one and they they just progress through it and stuff. You know, I don't know how many chapters they read per day, but they're going. You know, like I said, verse by verse by verse. Then they're, they're not jumping around. And like I said, they are they are they are reading it uh, and stuff, you know. And so we want to in observation again. It's important that we start. We begin with prayer. No matter what we do, we begin with prayer. That should be a yes. basic thing and stuff. Begin with prayer. We begin our day with prayer and stuff, you know. In our day with prayer. So so when we start reading the Bible, begin with prayer. And again, it don't have to be no long drawn out prayer and stuff. Mm -hmm. You can just say, God, give me a revelation out of your word, Lord God. Let me see wonderful things out of your word and everything and stuff. You know, Holy Spirit reveal some wisdom to me out of your word. So it can be simple, but begin with prayer and everything. Because uh, prayer too is stuff, you know, one of the things you want to pray too is that you have some quality time and some quiet time. You know, I was I was I was on this Zoom yesterday, and it was a you know, clergy retreat. It was just a couple of hours, and one of my prayers was, Lord God, you know, that, you know, just give me some quiet time. Don't let the phone be jumping off the hook and, and stuff, and don't let the you know, interruptions come and and stuff, so I can be focused. To be focused, that's the same thing with Bible reading and stuff, you know, pray that you be, be stay focused and everything, because you know, you know, you know, the, the devil is busy and stuff, yes. you know, so as you start reading the Bible sometimes, you get sleepy, the children start knocking at your door, your husband won't this or that and stuff, phone is ringing, texts are going on, emails going on, all kinds of emergency jumps up and everything, you know. You know, because because you know the devil doesn't want us to. He, he don't want us to read it, but most of all, he don't want us to to apply the word and stuff. But before we can apply, we have to read it and stuff. So then, begin your Bible study with prayer, and then uh, in our observation, it says identify the context, and you're gonna find this word keep jumping up over and over in all uh, aspects of an observation, applications, and interpretation. We have to identify the context. And so that's one of the most important principles of handling the word properly and stuff and to interpret the scriptures if we do it in light of the context, because context always rules in interpretation, because if you don't stick with the context, then you can take it, you know, you'll misinterpret what, what the Bible author is saying in that particular passage. Now, you might be, you might have an application or you might have something in the, in, the, in the word, but your context might not be the one that supports your thought. It might not be the one that supports your application. So you want to make sure that if you're going to apply something and stuff, then make sure you grab the right context, the right context. And the word context means that which goes with the text, what goes along with the text. So in general, context is an environment in which something dwells, the setting where something exists or occurs. And so and think about this, you know, no, that's a John 3.16. You know, John uh, uh, 3.17 is part of the context. I'm just using an example. There are other scriptures too, but, but John uh, 3.17 is part of the context with John 3.16. So you, like I said, you grab more than just one verse is what to do with the context. You know, and I heard uh, my my brother before he passed. He was a he was a member of a church in Houston, and the pastor was a uh, uh, pastor Ralph West, great scholar, of the, a great theologian, great orator of the Bible and stuff. And he stated that the context that context rather without text. It's just a con. I mean, you're trying to con <laughs> people into believing something that's not in the word of God and stuff, you know. So con so context without text is a con and stuff. Wow. So in, in Bible study, context, again, it's the words, it's the phrases, and the sentences <sighs> surrounding a particular word, phrase, a, a, sentence, a, a sentence, yeah. It gives meaning to words, it gives meaning to phrases, it gives meaning to sentences and help us to understand exactly 
what the author is saying. Think about this for a minute. Now, if you tell somebody something and stuff, you know, you want them to understand what you said. You don't want them to twist your words, do you? No. No, you don't want them to twist your words and stuff. So that's what that's why in context, you know, when same thing in the Bible and stuff, when you're reading something, the author don't want God don't want you to twist the words that you read and everything and stuff, you know. He wants you to understand what is being said and say the same thing that he is saying. You might say it in a different way. Now I'm not saying you're gonna say it in a different way, but you don't change the entire meaning of what is being said and stuff, you know. So think about that when we're trying to, uh, when we're studying the Bible the next time and stuff, you know, that you, know, you don't want people to to uh, take your words, you know, out, out of context or misunderstand what you were saying. You know, you don't want to do the same thing to God's word. And again, context rules uh, and determines the interpretation of the passage. So it's important, again, that we know the context of, of any passage that we are studying. And so um, uh, words can have different meaning. We talked about that several times, depending yes. on how they are used. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about words that, that spell different, but have the same phonetic. I'm just saying the exact same word can have different meaning. And so to illustrate how context gives meaning to words, let's look at the word trunk, T-R-U-N-K, trunk. Suppose someone were to ask you, what does the word trunk, T-R-U-N-K, mean? And then how would you respond? Well, if you're going to give a help, be give a helpful answer, and, and, and especially an accurate answer, you, you first have to ask, how is the word used? Because the word trunk can have many different uh, definitions and stuff. So somebody asks you what the word trunk means and stuff, ask first of all. Uh, uh, how is it being used and stuff? How is it being used? So a trunk, again, could be mean a, a, a luggage compartment of a car. Most cars have trunks. You know, the SUVs don't have much of a trunk, but most cars come with a trunk and stuff. It also, a trunk could be a be that uh, flexible snout of an elephant. The elephant has trunk, amen? Mm -hmm. And then it could be a large, rigid piece of luggage used for transport, not clothes and personal effects. It also can mean this, the main stem of a tree, or it could be, be uh, it could mean shorts worn for swimming. Again, trunk can have all these different meanings and stuff. So, you know, sometimes it's, you know, good to, you know, somebody ask you what it is, ask them how it's being used and stuff. So, therefore, the only way to know the intended meaning of a word is to examine the context in which the word is used. The environment, which is the surrounding text, and which the word appeals will show you which of the possible meanings are intended. For instance, for instance what would the word trunk, T-W-N-K, mean in the following account from a trip to Africa? It says, I remember seeing this huge trunk appear before the window of our car. We have been informed to always line up our car in the same direction in which the elephant was going in case he charged at our vehicles. As we saw this trunk swinging back and forth and the elephant face coming closer, we knew it was time to leave. So since context is that which surrounds or goes with the text, what information in this passage gives us a proper understanding of the word trunk as it's used here? Let me just pull that up on my screen. So, you know, and stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me get it a little bit bigger. So again, you know, I, I read that passage, this passage right here and stuff. I read, I read that passage and everything. So we're gonna look at the context. And so we had to get the proper understanding of the information that's provided in that paragraph. And so we see the word elephant appeal, uh, the word elephant appears twice. And the trunk described as a huge, as huge as swinging back and forth. And so by examining the, the context, therefore we discover the facts that surround the use of this word. And we can determine that in this particular passage, the word trunk means the flexible snout of an elephant. It's not the luggage that you carry your clothes in. It's not a compartment on your car. Based on the context, this, all the surrounding words, in this paragraph, 
You get me? It's based on all this information in this one particular paragraph and yes. stuff. We, we, see, we see that the trunk is talking about an uh, elephant, you know, his flexible snout and everything. So that's the same concept you would use and, 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 and when you're reading the Bible and stuff, you know, you see this one word and stuff, you know, and like we said, love that has so many different meanings and stuff. And so when you read the whole context, we can determine what the word love might mean in that passage that you're reading. You know, it could be talking about sexual love. It could be talking about family love. It could talk about friendly love. It could talk about God pay love. But you have to read all the words that surrounding that one passage to yes, determine right. What meaning did you would uh, uh, give to the word love? Amen. 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 So, so in inductive study, it's the context is determined by the things that are obvious, things that are easy to see. And stuff. I think I got. I skipped. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 in, in depth of study, context is determined or identified in the same way by carefully observing what is repeated in the text and seeing how it relates. So if you observe what is said and you pay attention to repeated words or phrases or ideals, you will clearly see the context in any book or any chapter or any passage that you are studying. And so then the, next, the third step we do is we have to observe the obvious. Observe the obvious. First one, we, we said that, that, that we need to do is begin with prayer. Then we begin to identify the context. And then we start picking out some of the obvious things that's in that text and stuff. So when you observe the text, by th look at things that are easy to see. Look at facts about people. Is it an old man? Is it a young man? Is it a prophet? Is it a priest and stuff, you know? Identify the places and stuff, you know? Where is it taking place? Is it taking place in the synagogue? Is it taking place, uh, you know, uh, in the country? Is it taking place in somebody's home and stuff? And then, uh, then uh, identify the events that capture your attention. Is somebody running? Is somebody happy? Is somebody crying? What are they doing and stuff? And so we have to identify people, places, and events that are easy to see and stuff, you know. And these kinds of facts are often repeated, and this makes them easy to see. So if we keep our focus on the obvious, we will begin to discover some significant or repeated ideals. And these uh, will in turn show you the context of the book, chapter, past, or verse you are studying. For example, if you decide to put a, together a jig, jigsaw puzzle, where do you start? corners the corners and stuff the corners and the edges they're easy to find because they're shaped but they all <laughs> have that shape same shape so it's easy to kind of if you do a, a jigsaw puzzle you know like me now that's why i start the corners or the edges and stuff yeah. start the corners and then you work on, on the edges and stuff then they say you know you got the framework of that puzzle and stuff you know and then you start looking for similar patterns and stuff you know so it's easy to put that puzzle together and stuff you know of course some of them might be just whole one little color and stuff but again you're looking at shapes and stuff is this the right shape to go into that shape and stuff you know you're not trying to force a, you're not trying to force something around into a square hole and everything so you start with the edges and stuff and then work away then you then you work around and stuff so same thing when you're reading the bible look for the obvious facts the details and stuff that establish the framework and studying that passage of the book or whatever. And so to put together a frame for the text, begin with the things that's obvious in this book. And so I want to bring up, uh, stop sharing this. Uh, uh, I got two things uh, I, I want to bring up. I'm not sure I can bring them at the same time. Do, 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 do. Hmm. I don't think I could bring that up right now. But what I want to do if, for, for you, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. I 
gonna try it one more time. Hold on. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Here it is. I want to bring this up. I think I got it up. So I got, I got, I'm bringing up First John chapter four. Mike that's not showing on Facebook right this minute, but hopefully it'll come up soon. Yeah, okay. And it's probably harder for you to see this, this. So that's why it's good to have it in your, uh, have your own Bible. So I brought up on the screen. I want to look at First John chapter uh, four and verses seven through uh, twenty-one. And so, and so this is uh, this is the New King James version that I'm showing right now. And if you look at, let's read verse. Uh, I'm gonna go start reading. It says, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God." And everyone who loves is born of God and knows, let me see what I bring it up, knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to, the, to be the propitiation of our, for our sins. But love, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. <clears throat> no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and, be, and believed in, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. For he who fears uh, has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he loved us. I'm so I'm gonna stop right there. So what's the one word that keeps jumping out over and over and over again? Love. Love. And so that lets us know that love is like the theme of, of this and stuff, you know. And so that's what jumps us out of is love and stuff. So that's one of the sense that's that's something that's very obvious in this text and everything. And so that's what I said. That that should be the framework of our interpretation. Love. And, and more specific, God's love, the love of God. That should be the framework of our, when we want to, when we want to interpret this scripture and keep it in context. It, these, these verses are dealing with love. And if you continue on to the last verse, you know, it's, it's still talking about love and everything. So that's so, so, so the framework of the context of what John is talking about is love. Love, love for God, love for one another, you know, not loving the world, it's, you know, loving our brother. You know, it's all about love and stuff, you know. And so, so that's 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 some of the obvious things and stuff, and it's repeated over and over and over again and stuff, you know. So that's that's how you begin to look at the context and, and to start framing what the or what these verses are talking about and everything. So I just wanted to bring that up, and one of the things I want to um, want to bring up too, uh, this is the New King James version. You see, it it has uh, it's broken down into different paragraphs, and you know we consider these pericope. Knowing God through love is is verses seven through eleven. So you can just take seven through eleven, and you know that's one of the contexts you can speak from. And then then it says seeing God through love. That's twelve through sixteen. That's another context we can get. So you got the like the immediate context, 
And then you have, you know, the, the, the like I said, we start, so we start at the narrow and go out wider. So we can go, when we want to branch out a little bit further, we can bring in 12 through 16, or we can also bring in seven through 17 through, through 19, and also 20 through 21. So all that is part of the context of love. So it depends on how much time you have. And, you know, when you're preaching there, sometimes you, you can't in one session and stuff, one hour or whatever, but, you know, preach an hour, set 30 minutes or 45 minutes and stuff. You might not be able to preach seven through 20 and stuff you know so you might want to narrow your context but it's all and focus in on what those uh those uh verses are talking about and so so let me just stop sharing let me bring up another version of it share screen let me go back to this first Meg is saying she can't hear you, but you're not talking now. Yeah, I'm not talking right now. I'm pulling up something on the screen. So now I'm pulling up. A, a, this is the same uh, uh, verses, but this is in the New American Standard Bible, uh, uh, Bible and stuff. And you see how it's broken down. Can you hear me now, uh, Deacon and Maggie? Uh, see, it's broken down. It, it has two uh, major paragraphs for its content, whereas in the New King James Version, had, I think about four and stuff. And, and that's not all that important, but it's just let you know, you know, about the pericope. And the New American Standard Bible is broken down verses seven through uh, uh, 14 is, you know, it, 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 it's a context for one paragraph. And then 15 through 21 is another context and stuff of another paragraph. But you can, like I said, you can put it all together and stuff, or you can just break it up if you want to. It depends on how you want to present this uh, in your teaching or your preaching and everything. So that's why I said, that's why a good study Bible, it kind of helps you, but you can't, you know, but it's still good. You need to read it for yourself too, because you might add, you might go from seven to 15. And that's still okay and stuff. So it's, it's no magic that you have to do seven through fourteen or it's a, or seven through or, or, or seven through twelve and stuff. You know, you know, you just you, you just, but it's still all part of the context and everything. So it all depends on how you want to break it and how much time you have and everything. So that's how you how you how you observe the obvious. The obvious in those verses is love. Talking about God's love. And so, so we know we're not talking about uh, brotherly love and stuff like that. We're talking about agape love and stuff. And we're not talking about family love and stuff. We're talking about agape love. So that's one of the obvious things when you look for a text. What are, what are some of the words that keep repeating itself over and over and over again? Okay. So observe the obvious and stuff. And then deal with the text objectively. In other words, let the text speak for itself. Observing the text in order to establish context must be your primary, who's this? That's what I need. Observing the text uh, must be your primary objective. So let the text itself show you it, uh, its repeated emphasis. Again, somebody trying to join. Huh? Somebody trying to join you. Yeah, I just, let it, I just let it clear. Okay. I think there's uh, even a, some friend, uh, uh, a bishop and stuff, I recognize from last time. So, so we need to look at it, you know, look at it over and over again and see what the primary objective it is and stuff. So often the only reason for being in the word, we do it subjectively. We, we, see, we do it to get something for ourselves. So, so we'll sit. So sometimes we read it subjectively to just to find verses on, on, on healing or find verses on peace or find verses on joy and stuff. So that's read it subjectively and stuff. You no, know, get something for ourselves. And that's not a bad thing either and stuff. But we need to look for something that, uh, uh, you know, we look for things that minister to our hearts. Or, or we find a verse that we can use to help someone or set someone straight. But again, that's not a bad thing. But that not, we should not always read it subjectively and stuff. Because God wants us to, to really read it uh, 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 objectively, you know, and stuff. So, so we can get really the truth out of it. Because sometimes when we read it subjectively, guess what? We've taken it out of context and stuff, you know. So, so it's good to read it objectively and stuff. That way we're going to get the truth out. Of it. We're going to understand what's being said, why it's being said, who's said, and all that thing. So, so our, our primary goal in reading the Bible is to uh, uh, know the truth. And then, uh, then, then we, uh, then we uh, adjust our beliefs 
in our lives accordingly. Because sometimes, again, we some things we have heard over and over again, but it's not really what the Bible says. But when we That's read right. it uh, objectively and stuff, you know, you know that way we can get the real truth out there, and we then we then we adjust uh, what our, our faulty beliefs were and stuff. You know, we adjust our faulty belief to the truth. So, so granted, some portions of in the book we are studying might minister to us more than others, but the truth and the context of it should never change. The message of the book itself will always be the same. Because when you read most of, when you read First John, it's gonna all okay, what you read, what you what chapter you pulled up, most of the time it's gonna be about love. Yes. Some form or fashion or something. Yeah. That's the main thing of First John is love. It yeah. is love, love, love. So if you read the subject, object, or whatever stuff, that that's never gonna change. It's how you present it. You know, it might be changing and stuff like that. But the message itself is still about love and stuff. So you might, you might, you might present it about, you know, well, how can you love God with, uh, without loving your brothers and stuff you see every day. You might present it that God, you know, first love me and stuff, you know, and stuff. So you, you, you'll be presenting, you might present it different, but it's still about love. It's still about love and stuff. So even though the word should be looked at objectively, as again, we can still look at it subjectively as well. When we pause to reflect on what God is saying and how it applies to us, application comes in that's subjectively and stuff, you know. So when we, when we study the Bible inductively, we read it also devotionally. You know, how, you know, I can't read the songs without reading the devotionals. So the book, all the songs in, in, in the Bible, they are devotional to me and stuff. I mean, they give you information too, but a lot of times they are good for devotions. They're very good for devotions. A lot, if you, a lot of times when people, uh, when they open up, they're in, in, a, say in a meeting and stuff. A lot of times when they open up the servants and you read the scripture, what's the book they go to most to read? The book of Psalms. It's more like a devotional, you know, for us and everything. So by devotional, it means with a heart that wants to hear what God is saying to us. God speaks to us personally through his word. So as we read and as we study, we need to take the time to listen to what God is trying to say through the text. And so then, like I said, we read it objectively, and then we read it with purpose. We read it with purpose. And when we read it with purpose, there are questions that we ask in order to get the whole story, in order to get all the details. So, there, so it says that serious Bible students are taught to ask the five W's and the H. The five W's are who, what, when, where, and why. And the H is how. The five W and H. Remember, remember that when you're studying, think about five W's and the H. Five W's and the H. Five W's and the H. Who, what, we, and where, and why, and how. The who, when you, when you ask who, you, you want to ask who wrote it? Who wrote First John? Who wrote Galatians? Who wrote Timothy? Who wrote those books? So, so the first the, a W is who. Who wrote it? Who wrote the book? So the author of the book is important. We're going to find out in a minute why. Then you ask who said it? Because sometimes somebody wrote it, but then within there, you know, Paul and some of his writing, he said, uh, 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 not God said it, but I said it and stuff. So we want to ask, so who said it? When you read some, who said it? Who are the major characters? Who are the major characters that you're talking about? You know, the major character in, in the book of Ruth. You know, Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, mm -hmm. yeah. major character in Esther, Esther, Mordecai, Mordecai Haman, mm -hmm. some of the major characters. So who are the major characters in the book, or books that you are reading now? You think about that now when you, you've been reading a book. Who are the major characters? Who wrote that book that you are reading right now? You read a book and about who wrote that book and stuff. Who are the people that's mentioned in there? Whom is the author speaking to? 
about whom is he speaking? Those things are important, especially when you get something those those controversial scriptures. If you ask those those five W's and the H, you know, you you realize that you know, people when people are trying to interpret it, they're interpreting it wrong because they they haven't considered the who, what, when, where, why, and how and stuff. And so, who deals with the authorship of the book of the Bible? Who deals with the authorship and stuff? You know, a lot of times when we read Timothy, sometimes we think. Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, we think, who is the author of that book? We think Timothy, we think Timothy is the author, but Timothy is not the author of 1 mm -hmm. Timothy and 2 Timothy. Paul. Paul is the author of it and stuff. But most of the books, though, that carry a name, you know, it, the person is the author, not all the time. We can't assume because right. it has that name on it that, that that person is the author of the book and stuff. So we need mm -hmm. to know who is the author of it. And so in order to understand who wrote a book, it would force us to seek to learn something about the author. You know, when I get a book, you know, when I read, I haven't read a novel in a long time, but you know, when I get a book and stuff, you know, I got this book, Prophetic Protocols and Ethics by Jennifer LeClaire. And so on the back, it tells me a little bit about the author and stuff. That's why I always look and see who the author is and read a little bit about the author. It's important to know who the author is and stuff. And then I don't just stop there and stuff. Sometimes I Google and stuff, you know, just like on Facebook and stuff. Sometimes, you know, you hear a person's name, you go with Facebook, look the name up, and then what you do, go to the about and stuff, you know, see if they put anything with the, with the birthday, you know, what church they go to, what they like and stuff. And like, you want to know a little bit about the person and stuff, you know, and stuff, you know. And so that's what I said when you read a book, you want to know a little bit about the author and stuff, you know, and stuff, his background and his life you know when was he living and all those things stuff so for for example understanding i need to turn my alarm on to my alarm off um understanding paul's background is quite helpful in interpreting his letters to understand his background in judaism as a strict pharisee and to know what he was converted know that he was converted to christianity in an intense experience on the damascus road certainly shed some light on understanding some of his letters. It does and stuff, you know, you understand his background. It will shed some light on that. It's always on. So, and so if we, if we know that Paul wrote a particular letter or epistle, uh, so, you know, it's going to sound the same. Think about that. You know, the apostle John, just about all his uh, books or letters or epistles, they say, they, they sound the same. You know yeah. the Johannine and this stuff. You you can know the Johannine mm -hmm. books and stuff if you just if you didn't if you just flip to it and you didn't look at the top and see what book you in and stuff. As soon as you start re reading some of uh, the uh, uh, John's uh, uh, the Apostle John's uh, 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 books or epistles, you will know. Oh, I'm reading. I'm in one of John's uh, epistles and stuff. You know, you know that the same style and stuff. You know, that's that's why people like the Book of Hebrews or uh, stuff. A lot of people said they, they, the author is really. They don't know who the author is, but when you read that book and stuff, it, it really points to Paul. And I still know it's a debate who actually wrote it, but like I said, if you read that book and stuff, a lot of things, the style and, you know, and all that and stuff, it points to Paul as the author and stuff, you know. So helping to understand the background and stuff, you know, and stuff, you know. And then when you read uh, uh, the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and, and John, they had different backgrounds. And so they wrote a little bit different and stuff. And the audience was a little bit different based on their background. So again, it helps you to understand a book by the author and everything. Mm -hmm. so, so, we, so we could not connect Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which says, therefore, if any man uh, be, in uh, be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so if we didn't know that Paul had a Damascus Road experience and stuff, we, 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 you know, we would figure he didn't know what he's talking about, but he had that. He was a new creature after he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He said, if anyone may be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. So Paul loved the stuff that he believed you know, when he was, you know, before he came to Christ and stuff, when he was, just a, when he was practicing a Pharisee and studied under uh, the Sanhedrin and stuff, you know, he, he, his, his thinking changed and stuff after he met Jesus and stuff, you know, it changed and stuff. So knowing the author helps us in interpreting the scripture. Amen. I'm, I'm going to skip the rest and go on, keep on going on. And then let's look at the book of Revelation. Um, 
as an illustration. Well, let me read that part. It's the accent to whom he wrote a book is important because it carefully uh, focused on the conditions and the circumstances of the recipients of the letter and the epistle. Let us use the, the, uh, the book of Revelation as an example. So to whom did John write the book of Revelation? He wrote it to a group of people undergoing persecution at the hands of the Roman emperor. And so the conditions during this time uh, was one of severe persecution. And so from writing to the people gripped in the throes of a hostile government, you would probably not risk writing to them in plain and ordinary languages. Rather, you would probably write to them in symbolic, figurative, and cold language. You would write in a way that they, the persecuted ones, could understand you, but not your enemies. And this is precisely what John did in the book of Revelation. He wrote much of the book in hidden and cold language. In fact, the Greek word for revelation is apocalypse, which means an uncovering. So therefore the book of Revelation was a covered or a hidden message to the enemy, but an uncovered message to the persecuted Christians. And because the message was coded, symbolic and hidden to the enemy, they did not burn and destroy the scrolls as they did Jeremiah's prophecy. And so through coded, symbolic, and figurative language, God sent his message through John to the persecuted churches in the Roman Empire. Now, at this point is overlooked. One can easily miss the intent of the book of Revelation and therefore can grossly mis misinterpret it. Amen. So we cannot uh, 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 interpret Revelation figuratively. We can and stuff, you know, because there's a lot of symbolism there and stuff, you know. There's a lot of codes there. Think about, you know, some of the hymns. It's important to when you sing a hymn to, look at when who wrote that hymn and why it was written. You know, some of those old hymns doing they've been doing slavery, it was in coded language and stuff, you know. They were sit, they were singing a song to each other and stuff, you know. So the so the slave master did not did not know what they were saying. Right. So something that so sometimes let's like say when you read in Revelation, they're saying it's in more of a coded a uh, 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 coded message. So the enemy would not know what's being said and stuff, you know, and everything. So again, too, you know, no matter what you're reading and stuff, and even the hymns and stuff, I know there's a book about you know the uh, history behind a lot of the hymns and everything too and stuff. But it's good to yeah. know when you're singing a song, you know, why do they say "Pass me not"? That, no, "Pass me not." And people say, well, no, God's not going to pass us by and stuff. He's always with us. But if you understand the background, you'll know the meaning of the song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. You'll know the meaning of it and stuff, you know, and stuff. So again, there's the, so, so you have to, that's why, that's why you ask who, you know, who and when and where and why and all those things when you're reading something and stuff. And then, so the second W is what? What are the main events? What are the major ideas? What are the major teachings? What are these people like? And what does he talk about the most? What is his purpose in saying that? We, we used to love that what? And, and, and when we looked at first John chapter four and stuff, you know, main events, the major idea, the major idea was love and stuff, you know, the major teaching was love and, and stuff and stuff. So that's what the what asks. Then when, when was it written? When did this event take place? When would it happen? When did he say it? When did he do it? That's important. When you're reading some of those scriptures and stuff, you know, what was going on when Paul said women should keep silent in the church? You have to know the background before you can interpret that correctly and stuff, you know. And so people don't bother looking at the background. Why was that statement made? When was it made? And stuff. And so that's why that's why some misinterpretation occurs when you don't ask those critical questions and stuff. Yeah. Who, what? when and stuff, you know. So the hermeneutical question folks on the uh, when, uh, it's folks on the, on the passage of the scripture. This is one of the most crucial questions of all because it helps to place a passage in the right time frame and the right historical location. When is very important. When was written and stuff, very important. Now, not talking about when I uh, 
first took on a book. I go through all that and stuff. When, what the date of that book was. That's very important. Who wrote it? What was going on? Yeah. And stuff. Very important to know all that if you're going to interpret it correctly and stuff. Again, that's why sometimes, that's why a, a, a good study Bible comes in handy and stuff. Some of the plain James Bible, not as they're, they're good too. So some of the plain James Bible don't tell you that. Nope. When you're reading, when you when I'm reading on on, on uh, electronically, it don't tell me that and stuff, you know. And so that's why sometimes uh, evangelist reader and, and, and Doctor Bobby said that they need that hard book so they can write in and stuff, you know. And so that's that's when it really comes to being important and stuff, you know. That hard study Bible book, that book, that paper, and you can write in and understand when and stuff, you know, and what and why, who and stuff like that. And so, so if, if we lift a passage out of its historical setting, then we are likely to misinterpret its application for our modern situations. Like the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. Love it. Love it. No but a lot of people don't understand what's being said, who is being said to, what's going on and stuff, and stuff. I think if you, you understand that, you still can get some of the same meaning out of it, but they fail to realize what has been said, who's been said to and stuff like that and stuff, you know. So, so again, the historical setting of the Bible calls us to look at book sequence. Many of the books of the Bible are not in historical sequence. And so I look for I started the uh, uh, lesson that stuff I, when I came across that I was looking for my chronological Bible that must be down in another location. So I got books all over the place. And stuff. I couldn't find mine either. I was looking for mine. And I couldn't find mine. Yeah, I was looking for my like, I might have gave it away. I think I gave it away. Yeah, I, I need to go to my library. You know, the books in, downstairs, I don't think I have them in my electronic library to tell me what books uh, add and stuff. But anyway, but there, you know, there's a chronological Bible and stuff. Yeah. You know? And stuff. And that's when you if we read it chronological, you know, some of the stuff that happened in Job happened yeah. happened full, you know, right in Genesis 1-1. Some of the stuff yes. that happened at the same time and stuff, you know. It helps you understand what's going on. So the historical setting, it it it, it you know, it causes us to look at the book sequence again and stuff. It said in the old testament, Ezra and Nehemiah, they're out of chronological order. They're both post-exalic uh, books. Well, listen among the pre-exalic books. So the student of the Bible need to study to know the facts and will need to place these books in their proper historical setting so that message can be interpreted properly. Then where was it done? That's another W. Where was this done? Where was this said? And so where does this place? What is the geographical setting? Then why? Why was there a need for this letter to be written? Why was there a need for this statement to be said? Why was it mentioned? Why was so much or so little space devoted to this particular event or teaching? Why was this reference mentioned? And asking why something is written, we are concerned with finding the author's original intent. And that's important to know the author's original intent who he wrote a passage or a scripture. And so when we ask the why, we are using the best message to ascertain the meaning and the, the purpose that that prophet or whoever had in mind when they wrote that book. So to arrive, to arrive at the best intent of the original author, one has to do sound exegesis. If the true intent of this original author is to be understood, we must dig deep with our spiritual eyes and heart. And that's why I say, and, and, get, and use a good Bible translation, use a good uh, uh, commentary, and use other tools and stuff to uncover the, and discover the truth of the passage. Again, some things we're not just going to get by just reading the, reading the verse and reading the Bible. We need to some of these extra tools and stuff, you know. That said, some, you heard me mention Josephus, the historian and stuff, you know. And even some of those apocalypse books and stuff, you know, they're good information and stuff. They didn't make it in the Bible, but sometimes they're good to understand, to get the complete picture. You know, like if you're doing a crossword puzzle and that one piece is missing, that throw off everything. But those who are playing cards and stuff, you know, 
you know, and you're playing, uh, I'm not a card expert, but, but you know, it, uh, you got uh, uh, different things in there. and spades and, and, and things and like that. They mean something. And one is and missing <laughs> and you count the cards and stuff. You say, okay, now somebody got that one, that, 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 the other Trump card and stuff you're waiting for and they never play because it's missing and stuff. It throws off the whole game. So the same thing with the Bible stuff, you know, if that one piece is not there completely, it might throw off the whole uh, interpretation of that, of, of the past and stuff. And then, the, then we went over the five W's, and then the last thing we asked is the H. How is it done? How did this happen? How is this truth illustrated? And so when we ask the five W's, what's the five W's? What, when, who, where, and why, not why. Mm -hmm. And what's the H? How. All right. That's right, uh, uh, be it with. That's why I was trying to think of be it with and stuff. You know, you've been and stuff, you know, and you you know, you look for all these jokers and everything. If one is missing, it throws you off, throws the whole game off and stuff, you know. You might have to forfeit the game and stuff that you find all the cards and stuff, you know, and stuff. So again, accurate answers from the text to the five W's and the H question will help assure correct interpretation. It will assure the correct interpretation. Now, how many have asked those questions when they've been reading the Bible? How many have thought about, you know, the, the who, the what, the when, the where, the why? How many thought about the how? And so, but those questions are so important if you're going to get the correct interpretation of it, of a passage. So let us apply this technique, technique using one verse. And you can turn into your Bible to John chapter seven, verse one, the gospel of John. The gospel of John chapter seven. Denise, you got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> turn to your, this is Bible study now. When you come to Bible study, at least you have your Bible with you. <laughs> You should have your, you, <laughs> you should have a paper and pen, but if you don't have any of those days, please have your Bible with you. Because this is Bible study. Okay, John 7, 1, these. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jer or Jerusalem because the Jews sought to kill him. So who is this about? Who is this about? Who was doing the walking? Jesus. Jesus. I guess that answered my next question. What was Jesus doing? <laughs> walking in Galilee. Oh, he walking. was walking. <laughs> and where was he walking? Galilee. Yes. Galilee. He was not walking in Jerusalem. Why was he not in Jerusalem? Because the Jews were trying to kill him there. Because the Jews were trying to kill him. They were seeking to kill him. And so what things in response to after these things, the things that took place in the, and, and so the what things is, is the things that took place in the previous verse. Let me just bring up another one. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures. It's not part of my lesson plan, but I want you to so we, so kind, kind of get a, 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 a turn in your Bible to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. six, six. And then we'll get ready to get close. Take a, to close out. Okay, I'm gonna start reading. I'm gonna start reading verse 24 though. It says, no man, I'm in Matthew 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you should eat or what you should drink, nor yet for your body, 
what you should put on is not the life more than meat and the body um, than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into the bonds. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the litters of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, to this, which today is, is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father know that you have need of all these things. For seek you first the kingdom of God, and these, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I'm gonna stop there. Look at verse 33, it says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it says, all these things shall be added unto you. Now you heard me read, I read a little bit more than I wanted to and stuff, but what are all these things he said should be added unto you? What we're gonna eat, what we're gonna drink and what we're gonna wear, and where we're gonna live. That's right. So, so we don't have to be worried about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, about clothes and put on the back. He said, 32, it says, for after all these things. So that lets you know it in verse 31. It talks about these things and stuff. You know, 30 and 31, these things. Do the seek, Gentiles seek and stuff. And then it goes on and says, your heavenly father have know that you have need of, of all these things. So you, those, those words, you know, you, you, they've kept repeating itself. These things, these things, these things and stuff. So when you look at 33, it talks about these things should be added to you. And when you ask the question, what things? If you go back, it'll tell you what things and stuff, you know, in case, you know, you might, you know, so you can't say about money. It's not talking about money. And stuff. They're not talking about jobs. I mean, they might be a, a, a side effect of it, stuff. But he talked about we don't need to be we don't need to be concerned about clothing and eating and things like that. God take care of who he goes back up and stuff. He take care of the litters of the field and the birds of the air and stuff. You know, he can take care of us too and stuff. And on that, I'm going to close for today. But so start asking those five W's and H questions, and we will pick up uh, next week and stuff. Um, Yes, next week. We'll, we'll have Bible study next week. And so, so, yeah, thank you for your attention today. So I pray that you learn something, that you learn something, that you learn something, that you learn something. When you're reading the Bible, you know, pay attention to things that's repeated. That's part of your observation. Words that are repeated, phrases that are repeated. And you, it's just not a question. Well, why is this repeated? What is it referring to? And that give you, they'll give you some more insight into the scripture. Give you some insight into the scripture. Okay, and so now it's time for our prayer to take place. If you have prayer requests, we ask you that you uh, come forth at this time and, and put your prayer requests in, in there and there on Facebook or wherever, chat. We're getting ready to close out in prayer and we're just gonna pray for one another. We're gonna pray for one another. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you all, thank you all. So let's get ready to pray. We want to praise God that, uh, you know, Sandra Mitchell that used to be on, uh, she used to be on Zoom. You know, she had she had surgery today. And she came to, got the word that she came through, was successful. She was in recovery, doing well. Amen, pray for Jock, okay. Okay, so let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we are so thankful tonight, Lord God, that you tabernacle with us, Lord God. And so we just thank you for continued healing for Sandra Mitchell, Lord God. 
We thank you, Lord God, for bringing her through the surgery, Lord God. There was nobody but you, Lord God, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God, that everything was successful, Lord God. And we just continue to pray, Lord God, that she, her whole body would be made whole, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We thank you for bringing Donald Wright, uh, I can't think of her last name, Beaver, anyway, uh, through surgery also today, Lord God. Lord God, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are God that's everywhere, Lord God. At the same time, Lord God, two people was going through surgery for the same thing, Lord God, at different locations, Lord God. And so we thank you, Lord God, that you was right there with them, Lord God, that you never leave us, Lord God. We could be in the operating room, Lord God. We could be in the doctor's office or rehab, and you are there with us, Lord God. I continue to pray for the Riley and the Mishnah family, Lord God. I lift up Barbara Burroughs and her daughter Barbara for healing, Lord God, and whatever they are going through, Lord God. You know everything about them, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for uh, for Donald uh, Williams, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that his body will be healed, Lord God, from the source of his body, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, for Walter and William and Angela and George Plummer, Lord God. There's so much healing that needs taking place, Lord God. We lift up Juanita Rolette, Lord God. We lift up, Lord God, uh, others, Lord God, who's going through sickness, Lord God. We pray for a healing virtue to flow in their bodies, Lord God. We pray for a kid, uh, kid uh, the, the, I can't stand my writing tonight. Kitty, Kitty Deeks, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you continue to be with her, Lord God. Lord God, be her strength, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would just continue, Lord God, give her discipline, Lord God, in every area of her life, Lord God. We pray for Mother Sinclair, Lord God, who had a fall, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would just heal her body, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would meet that need, Lord God. Her family member doesn't want her to stay alone in the more, Lord God. So we, she's praying, Lord God, for somebody that to stay with her, Lord God, and some assistance, Lord God. So, Lord God, we just pray not only for her, Lord God, but we pray for Mother Oldness and Mother Phyllis Evans, Lord God, and pray for Yvonne Wallace, Lord God, and other seniors, Lord God, that might be living alone, Lord God, that have these health challenges, Lord God, these health issues, Lord God. We pray that you will walk with them, Lord God, lead and guide them, Lord God, provide for them, Lord God, supply for them, Lord God. We lift up John Collier to you, Lord God. You know all about his situations, Lord God, and Lord God, we know, Lord God, that you are able, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, that you will get his attention, Lord God. Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you will move in his life mightily, Lord God. Lord God, we just take our hands on the situation, Lord God, and we just put them in your hands, Lord God, because, Lord God, you can do better with him than we can, Lord God. But also, we pray for Ebony Collier, Lord God. We lift her up also to you, Lord God. We lift up all our children to you, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for parents and night, Lord God. Our children are so heavy on our hearts, Lord God. God. And so, Lord God, some of them are grown and on their own, but Lord God, they're still on our hearts, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, that Lord God, that we don't be an enabler to Lord God, but Lord God, we just entrust them to you, Lord God, even Lord God, if they have to go through, Lord God, hardship, Lord God, Lord God, because you said everything worked together for the good, Lord God, for those who love the Lord, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, as they go through hardship, as they go through difficult times, Lord God, Lord God, that there will be a teaching experience for them, Lord God, that they are grow and they'll thrive, Lord God, even the challenges of life, Lord God. Lord God, we would do things ourselves, Lord God, and did not kill us, Lord God. So we know, Lord God, that if we suffer, Lord God, or, have, or go without things, Lord God, it's not going to kill us. It's not going to kill our children, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we just pray again, Lord God, that as uh, for our children, Lord God, that we, again, that we put them on you, Lord God. We give them to you, Lord God, and we continue. We don't just don't pray for them, Lord God. We don't toss them aside, Lord God, but we continue to pray for them night and day, Lord God, the Lord God, that, they, that they'll come to you, Lord God, that they'll look to you as the Savior, Lord God, they'll look to you as the provider, Lord God, they'll look to you, Lord God, to supply their daily bread, Lord God, and their needs, Lord God, and Lord God, we just continue to pray, Lord God, that you will move, Lord God, and everyone's under the sound of my voice, Lord God, whatever they might be going through, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you will be with them, Lord God, we continue to pray for the situation, Lord God, over in Ukraine, Lord God, and 
bless you, Lord God. And Lord God, we just pray, Lord God, that you that they are sitting under the table with you, Lord God. That Lord God, that you would just direct them, Lord God. Lord God, that you would just turn this situation around, Lord God. You like Lord God, because you are a way maker, Lord God. So we actually turn it around, Lord God. Protect our men and women and boys and girls, Lord God. And, and all those innocent bystanders, Lord God, over in Ukraine, Lord God, and other cities over there, Lord God. Protect them, Lord God. And Lord God, those ones who want to leave, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, they'll be able to get out, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord God, Lord God, again, Lord God, that you would touch hearts of people, Lord God, in authority, Lord God. Lord God, even our uh, President uh, uh, Biden, Lord God, and, and Vice President Kamala Harris, Lord God, and every President, Lord God, and Commander, Lord God, of every country, Lord God, and the NATO representative, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that they have the ultimate uh, mind, a piece of people's mind, hearts, Lord God, on their minds, Lord God, that they are not doing anything for selfish reason or pride for reason, Lord God, but we pray, Lord God, that they can come together, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, and I pray for those, Lord God, that are still looking for jobs, Lord God, that you will open doors for them, Lord God, Lord God, let them be gainfully employed, Lord God, and Lord God, let them not be weary and well doing, Lord God, let them not turn, Lord God, to, 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 to doing the wrong thing, Lord God, but Lord God, let them continue to trust you, Lord God, because Lord God, you can fix it, Lord God, you can open doors, because we just read in the scripture, Lord God, in Matthew 6, 33, Lord God, Lord God, we seek you first, Lord God, and your righteousness, Lord God, things will be added to us, Lord God, things, Lord God, that we need for our daily bread, Lord God, our daily living, Lord God, so I thank you, for, Lord God, for everything that you are doing for our uh, young men and young women, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, for the confirmation, Lord God, of uh, uh, Judge Jackson, Lord God, we just pray, Lord God, that the history be made, Lord God, and, and confirming her to the Supreme Court, Lord God, Lord God, not just because she is black, not because she is a woman, Lord God, but Lord God, we just pray, Lord God, that the Lord God, that the, the, the Supreme Court, Lord God, be, be, be representative of everybody, Lord God, every race, every culture, Lord God, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, and we just thank you, Lord God, what you're doing in our lives. We pray for every pastor, Lord God, we pray for every church right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we pray as pastors, Lord God, that we be led by your spirit, Lord God, that we will feed the children, Lord God, the, the sheep, Lord God, with good word, Lord God, and help us, Lord God, continue to study to show ourselves approved, Lord God. We pray for every minister, Lord God. We pray for every associate minister, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for every deacon and every trustee, Lord God. We pray for those who are traveling, Lord God, that they have, Lord God, arrive and come back home safely, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord God, again for healing, Lord God. So much sickness is going on in this world, Lord God. We ask you to heal of COVID, Lord. heal of pneumonia, Lord God, heal of the flu, Lord God. Heal of cancer, Lord God. Heal, Lord God, of MS, Lord God, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, Lord God. Whatever sickness is in our bodies, Lord God, we ask you to heal, Lord God. Deliver us, Lord God, from sick arrest. Deliver us from drugs. Deliver us from alcohol, Lord God. Deliver us, Lord God, for any vice, Lord God. Lord God, anything that wants the Lord God that's not of you, Lord God. So we pray, Lord God, that we just take care of our temple, Lord God, which is the, uh, our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. God. We want a clean vessel for the Holy Spirit to drill in, Lord God. So help us, Lord God, take care of this temple, Lord God. And Lord God, we thank you, we praise you, Lord God, for the word this evening, Lord God. We just pray, Lord God, you continue to bless your people going in and coming out, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. So Tonight, I, uh, again, I bid you good night. Glad you tune in for this study. I pray that, it, that you, as Deacon and Maggie said, that she learns a little more nuggets, that you got some little bit nuggets. Amen. 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 Again, practice, 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 practice. Amen. Put those things into practice that you both heard me say and, and, and saw me do also. And I said, stop practicing those five W's and that one H. Amen. Stop practicing today, tonight, when you start reading your word and stuff. Like I said, that's why, again, it's going to take some time, and we're not trying to read a whole chapter at a time and stuff, you know, but if you need to and stuff, you know, so some chapters are shorter than others and everything, but when you read it, read it intentionally. Be observant of it. Be observant of the text. Be observant of the words and the phrases and all that. Be observant of those things. And so, again, good night. May heaven continue to smile upon you and may you get a restful night's sleep. And may, if, if God's will, he wake you up in the morning and you can run on to see what the end is going to be. Amen. So don't, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. 
keep pressing on. No matter how hard it gets, just keep on putting one step, one foot at a time in front of others. Amen. Just take it slowly one day at a time, one day at a time. And sometimes just take it one hour at a time, sometimes 30 minutes at a time. Amen. Just take your time and breathe. Take your time and breathe. Learn how to exhale. Amen. Begin to breathe in through your, through your nose and exhale slowly and deep through your mouth. Amen. Amen. And that will that'll do your body good. Amen. Breathe in and breathe out. And then you'll release some of that stress that's on you. Release some of that pressure that's within you. Just by just doing some good deep breathing. Deep breathing. Amen. Do it five times. You know, every hour, just kind of just do it five times and stuff, you know. And as, you, as you're breathing in and breathing out, meditate on God's goodness. Just meditate on, on, on a scripture. Meditate on the scripture. Close your eyes and just meditate on a scripture and stuff. Meditate on the scripture. Again, good night, everyone. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. Good night. 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 Good night.